The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad to see all of you and welcome those who are watching online. Um, the title of this morning's message is Enjoying Jesus as Our Life and Our Life Supply. And we have been talking recently, uh, Dennis talked about focus, keeping our focus on Jesus. Um, but we've also talked about the Bible as being a book of life. And Jesus is life, Zoe life, divine life. He doesn't have life that he gives to us. He is life. So in touching him, we touch life. Now, before I really begin on the, the body of the message, I want to talk about this amazing document, the Didache. And that's a Greek word that means teaching, the teaching or the training. I think training is a better translation of the word, but it's the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations. And the Didache is a very, very short document, and it was lost in antiquity until an entire copy was found in 1873 in a monastery in Istanbul, Turkey, by a young cleric who had actually been trained in modern methods of, his, of studying historical documents. So he was well qualified. And when he found this short little 16 chapter document, it was in a book that had, they made books back then, they called them, them a codex. It wasn't a scroll, it was a codex. And usually they had um, a wooden cover front and back. and the documents were sewn into the book. And so the Didache was found sandwiched in with seven other documents. And it's really, it's said now that it's amazing that nobody ever um, found it or studied it until, it, that's only 150 years ago. Do you realize that? And so it really took the uh, world of antiquities and history. It took the world by storm. And at first there was a lot of excitement and then there was a lot of controversy. And it was studied intensively by scholars until a very astute scholar put it in context that made sense. And what he saw over years and years of study is that this is a logical progression of a long involved apprenticeship for Gentile believers who joined the Jewish community, the Jesus movement in the first and second centuries beginning then. And it's mentioned by Paul in a, at least a couple of scriptures. Thanks be to God. This is Romans six seventeen. Thanks be to God for you were slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching, that form of didache to which you were entrusted. And also in Titus 1, 9, holding firmly the trustworthy word that is in accordance with the didache, with the teaching, that he may be able both to exhort with sound doctrine and to convince those who oppose it. Now, the didache was a new believer with a mentor as that new believer learned to live an entirely new way of life. And this was called the way. And we know that the early believers, the church, was called the way, a new way of life. 
Now, the particular aspect of the dedicate that I want to um, talk about this morning is, well, two, primarily one, but I want to bring in another. There were two very upsetting chapters in this little booklet. The first was baptism, and you know wars have been fought over how to baptize. And, but it seems like in the Didache, if they had bothered to read this, if they had found this earlier, this says that baptize in running water, baptize in hot water, baptize in cold water, and if you don't have much water, baptize by sprinkling. The only thing is you don't baptize babies. Somebody has to be a reasonable, reasoning adult or at least a young person before being eligible because babies can't go through a lengthy apprenticeship in living a certain way. Now, the other chapters that upset, I mean, well, there was a lot. The baptism upset a lot of people. But what really upset people were chapters 9 and 10 about the Eucharist. Now, the early believers were within the fold of Judaism. There was no separation. This was a, they were Messianic believers, still Jews. The 12 apostles were Jews. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. So there is much in this book that sounds a lot like Matthew, but it's exceedingly Jewish. But you know, over the centuries, Jewish practices that had life to them gradually became dead formal rituals. Now, Eucharist, the chapter on the Eucharist, chapter 9, Eucharist simply means giving of thanks. I mean, it's not this holy title of something. And the Jews always gave thanks to God when they ate meals. And they believed that it was sinful to not give thanks to God, the one who provided food for us to eat. Um, the most significant point of this chapter, if you go back and read it, those of you who've read it in the past, is the life that's in it and that it points toward the kingdom, the kingdom that was, the kingdom that is, the kingdom that is to come, and the king is in our midst. It says, when two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And in the book of First John, it was a present fellowship with the Lord. It was the presence of the Lord. Jesus said, I am there in the midst when you are gathered together, when you're joined together, a symphony of spirits coming together to worship and praise and thank God. And the Apostle John said in 1 John, that which was, was from the beginning, which we heard with our own ears, which we saw with our own eyes, which we touched, our hands actually touched the Messiah concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, the person of eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us as a reality. That which we've seen and heard, we declare to you and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son. Today we're still fellowshipping with this wonderful Messiah. And these things we write to you so that your joy may be full also. This was a, a fellowship, a touching, a gathering together in his presence. And let me read you chapter 9 and then part of chapter 10. Chapter 9 of the Didache says concerning the Eucharist, which means the giving of thanks. Give thanks in this way. First, concerning the cup, we give thanks to you, our Father, for the holy vine of David, your servant, which you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant. Yours is the glory forever. 
and concerning the broken bread, we give you thanks, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant. Yours is the glory forever. And this broken bread, speaking of Israel, and now speaking of believers, this broken bread was scattered upon the mountains, but was brought together and became one. So let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom, for yours is the glory and power through Jesus our Messiah forever. And then, beginning in chapter 10, the first verse of Didache, excuse me, Didache 10 says, after you were satisfied, after you were full, give thanks in this way. This was not a token eating of a little morsel of bread and sipping a cup. It was a full meal. Moreover, we know now that it was celebrated with all the believers on Saturday evening because remember, the Jews, the day began, began at sundown and continued till sundown the next day. And the Jew, Jesus movement changed from the Sabbath because now their Sabbath had come, their Jesus had come. So they celebrated seven days plus one, which was eight days, which was a day of new beginnings. And they called this the Lord's Day. Now at this time in the first century, when they first began meeting, many had to work on Sunday, what we now know as Sunday. And so they would meet together, all the believers gathered together and have their Eucharistic meal on Saturday evening and celebrate Jesus and then meet together usually around sunrise on Sunday morning so they could celebrate and praise and worship and then go to do their jobs. This was a full meal and it was served weekly. Now we know that the book of Acts tells us that the believers met from house to house and enjoyed fellowship in one another's homes during the week. But on Saturday night and on Sunday morning, of course we know, we know where they met on Sunday mornings. They met in Solomon's porch connected with the temple. And so I assume that was pr a pretty amazing gathering because the church in Jerusalem all met together. Now, I don't know where they had their Sabbath meal, where, where they had their um, Eucharistic meal. Now, one thing about this, we know that it was a full meal that they celebrated together and that it was a very joyous occasion, very joyous occasion for them. And we know that although Jesus said to eat my body and drink my blood, they were not looking back to what Jesus had done for them. They were not just remembering what he would have done. They were rejoicing over what he was now doing, their fellowship with one another and their fellowship with him. And they were looking forward to what God would do in his kingdom that they were part of. So enjoying Jesus as our life and life supply, when we're born again, we receive eternal life. But then we are told to keep enjoying now and in the future. It's a present experience. Now, when the disciples met to celebrate this meal, it was around a table and pointing to receiving nourishment, to eating a meal, to enjoy food and drink. And nothing bonds us together quite like sharing a meal. We are the only animals who cook our food. We're the only animals that come together, prepare food, and, and enjoy meals together. And eating is much more than more significant than just taking in nourishment to sustain life. Around, around the table, we 
become families, friends, and communities. Meals mark significant times in our lives. Festive meals mark the big offense in life. We share life together. At birthday celebrations, we all share a common cake. In former times, when before refrigerators and bottled water and, and cans of soda and, and so forth, there were punch bowls. And I have an old book from, um, an old cookbook reprint from Charleston way back when. And my goodness, there are all sorts of recipes for all sorts of different kinds of punch. But it was significant to all share the cake. And at weddings, the celebration of the continuance of human life, we rejoice together and eat of a common cake. I don't really like the practice of people serving cupcakes for this reason, because it a cake shared by everyone celebrates our commonality. In the Old Testament, whether it was an annual feast of Passover or a Sabbath meal, God is praised and thanked for his goodness. The big celebration times instituted by God were called what? They were called feasts. And Jesus, of course, himself is the divine feast pointed to in the Jewish festivals. Now let's talk about the table of communion a little bit. In the early church in Jerusalem, they celebrated the full weekly meal on Saturday evenings. They attended a service together the following morning. During the communion meal, they celebrated not only the sacrifice of the cross, but the kingdom of God. And by the way, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within. It's a common experience that we can rejoice in and fellowship in together. They enjoyed the presence of King Jesus with them. And wherever the king is, there is the kingdom. And very exciting time. And you know where the word enjoy comes from? You know the root of that? It comes from a French word, or two words brought together, en joie. In joy or with joy. Containing joy. And we come together and meet with Jesus present with us to enjoy him. And John said, to fellowship that your joy may be full. The kingdom of God is within, Luke 17, 21. They didn't have any ri empty rituals at this time. They celebrated divine life, the divine life in them and with them as a daily experience they enjoyed. It was a very Jewish celebration. And by the way, in, the, in reading how the scholars pieced together the meaning of the Didache, they really had to study the history of the early church, which, of course, is our gold standard of what Christianity should be. Now, Jesus took over ancient Jewish practices and gave them new meaning which meaning we celebrate now. And they took on new life. All of a sudden, what had been a shadow, what had just been a picture, became a present reality. Once they were symbolic pictures pointing to the Messiah, now the shadows became living reality in the early Jesus movement. The disciples were united with one another and with Jesus. Now, this was remarkable. They shared one table Previously, banquets had um, been rigidly divided based on social status, wealth, position, titles. But suddenly, society was no longer segregated into male and female, rich and poor, masters and slaves, but all shared a common meal around the same table. Do you know, prior to the coming of Jesus, women did not sit down, nor did children. 
at the evening meal, they were segregated. Now the men reclined at table, but the women and children were off someplace else at another table. Now all came together, not just symbolically, but as a reality. And Jesus started something entirely new. When he took a cup of wine, drank of it, and then passed that one cup around the table for everyone to share. They shared one cup, and they shared one loaf. Of course, pointing to what we're told in 1 Corinthians, that we are part of one loaf. Each person broke off a piece of bread from one loaf. One common cup, one lo loaf. And at the end of the meal, they gave thanks, but there wasn't a priest, an ordained priest, giving thanks. The Didache says, let the prophets pray, and not rigid prayers like out of the Episcopal, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. They didn't just recite, wrote prayers. There is a suggestion of what, how to pray, but let the prophets share. So there was a, a flow. It was it was a it was prophetic. It was as as they were moved by the Spirit, not a formal prayer, not a formal affair, but everyone could pray impromptu prayers. There was no priest required. But the most significant point is the spiritual truth behind taking meals together. Jesus himself invited us to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Now, we know that the Catholic Church teaches that in blessing the bread and the cup that it becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. But we know for it first John, John tells us that they are fellowshipping in the spirit with Jesus. It's spiritual. And what prophet would eating a piece of somebody's flesh and drinking someone's blood do for us spiritually. It's spiritual experience. This is where the fellowship is. This is where the power is. We're connected with, we're joined by, with one spirit, with Jesus in the heavenly places. We can boldly approach his throne because he opened the way in the spirit. And it's in the spirit that we are to eat and drink him daily. All believers can now feast on the spiritual sustenance in fellowship with Jesus. Now, Jesus gives himself to us as Zoe life. Z-O-E, that's a quality of life. That's different from a physical life on earth. Divine life. Life is not something he has. Life is who he is. He gives us himself as our life, but then he continues to give himself to us as our life su supply. Now, by life supply, we mean something that sustains life, and we want this divine life in us to be sustained and grow and more and more transform us. What we eat and drink spiritually transforms the fallen nature of us into a new nature, a divine nature. When we read the account of creation in Genesis, it's not really so much the physical creation itself that's highlighted, but that which it represents. And we read of several different forms of life. We read about plant life, animal life, human life, and finally, divine life in the tree of life. People were created as unique receptors or containers for divine life. Now, unlike animals who have souls, we know that animals uh, can think and reason, they can be trained, that they have emotions, they can feel fear, they can feel joy like a dog when its master comes home. Um, and they definitely have emotions, so they have mind, will, and emotions, which is a soul. And we also have mind, will, and emotions, but we have something special. 
We were given spirits so that we can discover God and know God, the spirit in man. And the purpose of our spirit is to be a container for God himself to dwell in us. Adam was formed from the clay of the ground, and God breathed into him the breath of life. How are animals and plants created? They were spoken into existence. And God didn't breathe into them bios life or biological life. It was when the word was spoke them into existence, they had biological life. Humans have biological life, at least while we're on this earth. We also have human life and the potential to contain divine life. Our human spirit is a container designed to be filled with God. However, we know because of the fall, our spirits can connect with God's life, but we also have the capacity to connect with devilish life. We can connect with God. We can connect with evil spirits. In Genesis 2.9, we see divine life offered to Adam. God placed him in the garden, and before him was the tree of life. You know what? When God gives us a test, he's already given us the answer, right? Like in later on in the Old Testament when it's, he says, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. He showed Adam the answer. Choose life. But then we know Adam had a choice and he made the wrong choice. Food and drink in the Old Testament from Genesis to revelation. We've talked a lot about life, but this is about sustaining life, our life supply. Jesus, the one that we're supposed to live by him. We're supposed to live and move and have our being in him. The subjects of life and eating, life and eating and drinking are in the Bible from the beginning to end. The time of creation was all about life. It wasn't just the making of the physical universe. And after God created Adam, he showed him the proper food for eating. And next to the tree of life in Genesis, we see a river. We see the life su supply to sustain divine life in us, food and drink. Plant life requires water, nu water and nutrients. Animal life requires physical food and drink to survive. Spiritual life also requires proper eating and drinking. And the, one of the most wonderful things about eating spiritual food is that we don't gain weight. We can eat all we want. Can you imagine being able to eat whatever you wanted and however much? Because Jesus is our feast that's set before us. It's just the best eating and drinking ever. In Exodus, we find a lamb for a blood covering and roasted meat of that lamb for eating. In the wilderness, we read of manna sent from heaven, springs, wells, and a river flowing from a rock. Eating and drinking is a central thought in God's economy. God's economy is the way he runs the universe, and he placed life and eating and drinking to sustain that life all the way through the Bible. The gospel itself is likened to a feast. Jesus said that the gospel was like a marriage or wedding feast or a great supper prepared by a king. This tells us that the gospel is not just doctrine to be learned. It's a matter of enjoyment by eating and drinking. In Luke 14, 16, 17, the Lord Jesus spoke of a great dinner to which we were invited. Oh, in the prodigal son in Luke 14, 16 through 17. God, as a certain man in the parable, sent his... Oh, the, no, this is 14, 16. Is, this is the invitation to the banquet. Come, for all things are now ready. 
come, for all things are now ready. It's set before you. Full salvation is a great dinner. Now, in Luke 15, when the prodigal son returned, the father told his slaves to put the best robe on him, a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet. For his body there was a robe, his hand the ring, and sandals on his feet. These items signify the Lord's outward justification, accepting what Jesus has done for us outwardly, for our outward adornment. But this outward clothing was not sufficient to meet the son's need because he was starving. He returned home to his father because he was starving. He needed food within him. His father first adorned him to make him worthy, qualifying him to enter the father's house and feast with the father. But after the outward adornment, the father told his servants, bring the fatted calf, slaughter it, and let us eat and be merry. There was an inward filling that's required. We need not just outward justification, but we need inward filling continually. In the observance of the Passover, blood covered the house, but inside the house, the people enjoyed the meat of the lamb. This is the inward side, signifying the inward enjoyment of Jesus as our life supply. Before the prodigal son came back, he prepared himself to be treated as a slave, laboring day by day for his father. But the father didn't want his son to work for him, but to feast with him. When we come here to meet as a congregation, we come not just for teaching, we come for feasting, enjoying the presence of the Lord with us and fellowship with one another. In Father's house, there's a table waiting for us to come and feast. Just come and eat and be merry and rejoice. This is the only time we have during the week where we can come together and enjoy fellowship with Jesus together. Finally, in the book of Revelation, the conclusion of the Bible, we see Jesus in chapter 1 walking among the lampstands representing the churches. You see, when Jesus ascended, the time of his heavenly ministry began. The time of his heavenly ministry. And what is Jesus doing now with this life that he's creating in his living stones as he transforms us more and more into his image? He wants to build his church. He wants to build the living stones together. And to tell you the truth, for the past 2,000 years, there's been a lot of gathering of building materials, but there hasn't been very much building. We are entering a time of building. And Jesus doesn't build with our flesh, with our fallen nature. He only builds with the life he's created in us. Everything we let Jesus transform in us is what he can use for building his glorious church. So the book of Revelation starts by explaining, presenting, showing us the heavenly ministry of Jesus. And what is the great prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17? That we become a house built for him. Father, that they would be one just as you and I are one. Now, I don't see, when I study history, and I love studying history, very much building together outside of the times of the early church in the first centuries. I believe we are on the verge of seeing the greatest building program that we could ever imagine in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead of us. 
And as a matter of fact, Bob Jones prophesied that the 20s, of which we are now in, the 2020s, that decade, would be the time of God's rest. And where does God rest? He rests in a house built for him to inhabit. The verse of Kingdom Life Church, Ephesians 2.22, was as that we would be built together, stones put together to make a house for God to come and dwell in his fullness, in his glory. A place where God could come, settle down and be comfortable and rest. Tommy Tenney, years ago, wrote a book about God chasers, people running with all their hearts toward God and toward his presence. And he lamented the fact that there was no house where God could come and settle down. And he likened it to a very large man who would come to the fr a friend's door and stand at the door and look in. But because he was so large, he'd look around and see if there was a chair that would support his weight. And sadly, his weight couldn't be supported, so he would leave. God's been looking for a house. He says, where is the house that you will build for me? God is building a house where he can come and settle down in the weight of his glory, settle down with us. So Jesus is walking among his lampstands. Oh, may he find us a worthy lampstand. However, that's just the beginning of the book of Revelation. In chapters 2 and 3, we see a shift of emphasis. And the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation, we clearly see the matter of eating spiritual food. We see the life supply. The emphasis on, is on eating spiritual food. A promise is given to the Ephesian church that those who overcome will be given the reward of eating from the tree of life. We have the tree of life set before us. The third church at Pergamos is promised hidden manna. That's the heavenly manna. That's the manna in the golden pot that was hidden inside the very holy of holies in the Ark of the Covenant itself. It was set aside as special manna. Then finally, the seventh church, the church at Laodicea, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and him and he with me. And all seven churches are cautioned to have an ear to hear, which refers to the way we eat spiritual food. We eat, digest, and assimilate, and what we eat becomes a part of us, becomes who we are. In chapters 2 and 3, the Lord emphasizes that churches are places for eating and drinking Messiah as spiritual food. Not primarily places of teaching, not schools, not um, places to learn doctrine, but places to feast on Messiah himself. He is the tree of life. He is the hidden manna. We gather together to encounter the Lord and to dine on spiritual food. And finally, the book of Revelation concludes with, in Revelation 22, 1 through 2, a pure, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing 
of the nations. The Bible concludes as it began with life and life supply. Now, what is missing in all this? How to eat and drink. Now, when a baby is born, it's completely dependent upon its parents. It can do nothing for itself. Nothing with the exception of eating, taking in nourishment. It's the mother's responsibility to offer the baby milk. The baby has only one responsibility. It must eat for itself. And I know that's a really big deal in teaching mothers how to nurse. And sometimes the baby won't latch on and feed. And that's a very serious problem because we must eat for life to be sustained. And the same is true for us when it comes to spiritual nourishment. We all must eat for ourselves. God cannot do this for us. And by the way, I was once puzzled about the differences. This, the difference between eating and drinking and breathing spiritually. It's like, when, is, when do you do one and when do you do the other? Um, it seems that the eating, drinking, and breathing are all combined. When we breathe in the spirit, we eat and drink. And by the way, milk is water that contains food. Wine is the life juice of the grape mixed with water. So we can't really make a distinction. But when we do receive, we are breathing in. We are eating. We are drinking in the spirit. And by the way, breath contains water. There is vapor in the very air. And we know so air contains water. In the beginning, when the Garden of Eden was created, we know that there was no rain, but it was the mist in the air that gave liquid to the plants. Air with water vapor in it watered the Garden of Eden. Now, once for a science project, I made a terrarium. And as you know, a terrarium is a, like an enclosed garden, enclosed in glass, in an aquarium. Or I had a little round, kind of like a fishbowl, large fishbowl-like thing. And it has plants in it and a cover on it. And the very moisture in the air does the watering of the terrarium, which is really good for me because I have a black thumb. And uh, except for that terrarium, don't ever give me a plant because I e either overwater them or I forget to water them. I even managed to kill cactus. So, so the terrarium worked quite well for me. I don't know whatever happened to that thing. But so how do we eat and drink Jesus? We started using the term to pray read. When I read the Bible, I receive, I drink in the anointing. I don't just read the words. I just don't get the meaning with my head. You can drink the whole time you're reading the word because the word is life. The word is life. It's alive. It's living. And we can partake of the life supply that's on it. We don't have to, oh, by the way, we can eat of Jesus all day long. We don't have to say something aloud, but practices. Right now we're having a, a focus challenge, which is a practice to keep our focus on Jesus within us. So just during the day, and you don't have to say it out loud. And I love that song that there's no sweeter name than the name of Jesus. There's a sweetness on his name. All we have to do is think his name. That's how we call on the Lord all day long. And, and peace is wonderful. Peace is great. Eating and drinking is better. While we're in peace, 
call on his name and you'll feel an increase in the anointing and take that in, receive it. I mean, we can literally eat all day long. We can drink all day long. We can breathe him in all day long. He is a feast set before us. And I love that in Ephesians when it talks about being strengthened in our spirit. Remember, living things require a life supply to grow. I want to be a giant in the spirit, really huge in the spirit. I want to grow and grow and grow and grow, and that's my responsibility. If you want that too, then it's your responsibility, and this is how we do it. It becomes part of who we are, how to eat and drink. Right now, just think his name. Can you feel the increase in the anointing when you go to him? Now receive, drink that sin, drink him in, drink his presence in, his life supply. It becomes part of us, becomes part of who we are. We become what we eat. And Jesus talked about focus. Focus means to Behold with sustained attention. We need to come to him as a feast. We need to come to him and continually feast. And when we do that, we grow. In his presence, we grow. And I want to encourage those of you... Um, who perhaps have the book, The Ancient Blueprint for the Supernatural. And this is a, a workbook going through the first six chapters of the Didache, which are called the Way of Life chapters. Now, after we get to chapters 9 and 10, it's more of a book of how the community comes together and meets. But the first six chapters are the way we should live. And this is very good because we're designed to be set apart from the world and for God. And it's not just eating and drinking because we know that what we focus on and how we live is important to God because sin separates us from God. So we are called to live out of the life of Jesus. There is nothing unholy in the life of Jesus. So we're supposed to pay attention. This is the reason we established our small groups, so we could live the way that the early church lived, taking it seriously, being separated from the things of the world and separated unto God. But it's not just that. It's not just that. We have been given, we've had set before us a feast to partake of. We've been given a cup that overflows. We have been given banquet tables. And it, when you read the book of Revelation, you see that there's a marriage feast of the Lamb that we are invited to come to partake of. We're going to be eating and drinking spiritually for all eternity. We're not just going to be little workers for God and what he has planned in eternity. We're going to be fellowshipping and enjoying spiritual food and drink forever. Now we enjoyed Vicky's wedding yesterday, very small, only the pastors came. It was a very small room. But the celebration of continuance of life. What a beautiful picture Jesus has given us in celebrating that wedding for celebrating the wedding that's yet to come. However, the book of Revelation says 
the bride has made herself ready. So we have a responsibility in living in the way of life to put on those white garments, to have garments without spot or wrinkle, to have the inside of us, the life of Jesus, and we know the life of Jesus does not have spots, moral blemishes, and the white linen celebrates the garments worn by the priests in the Old Testament that were made of the white linen, clean and pure, that we are to make ourselves ready now. When we go be with Jesus, we are going to be past the time of making ourselves ready. And we will enter into the time where we will be given rewards, the rewards prepared for us. But there's something on our part that we must do to prepare. And one way is in the way that we live with Jesus being our life. Galatians 2.20 To let Jesus be our life. I live, yet not I, but he lives his life through me. Jesus in us, as us, and him doing his works through us. So the way we live is important, but continually drawing from him as our life supply is what he calls us to do now. Come, for all things have been made ready. It's a feast we tap into the life supply of Jesus in us. He is our life, and he is our life supply. He is our food and drink. And one thing I've been doing the past week is I've gone back to John's Gospel, which celebrates life and celebrates Jesus and celebrates our spiritual relationship with Jesus as no other gospel in the Bible. Now, Paul had a building ministry. He was a wise master builder. But we know that after Paul finished his work, 25 years later, John wrote the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the Book of Revelation. Because without continuous work, we tend to slide backwards and the churches had slidden backwards and they had become full of heresies. As a matter of fact, two of the heresies that John's gospel was designed for was that Jesus is God. Right in the beginning, Jesus, the Word, was God and he was with God in eternity past and that Jesus actually came in the flesh. Those were two main heresies that were dividing the church by the time John ever set stylus to, um, I'm not sure if he had papyrus in a pen or, or if he had, sometimes they had wax tablets that, that they would imprint to make the words. Before, I like to think of him putting pen to paper myself. But before John ever put pen to paper, there was a work that John needed to do to set things right again, to restore the churches, to fix the issues, to remind people of the correct doctrine of who Jesus really is, because that's the ground of our faith. And so John wrote about this life that we have been given to partake of. And we, as we studied the Gospel of John recently, it's the story of life and building. But it's our responsibility to partake of the life supply so that we can have life, so that Jesus in his heavenly ministry will have something to work with. And I believe that's one reason why it's so crucial and, and God has been speaking this life and life supply to me. He's been speaking the eating and drinking John, um, Jesus gave Dennis the word about focus and a focus challenge for us to take this seriously, to allow Jesus to live and move in us and become our very being. And I believe we're really on the brink as we um, 
during this time that Jesus has promised that he is coming, that he is coming not just to visit, like some of the revivals that have... Do you know that in the past, a revival lasted three or four years? That's very sad. So we really don't want a visitation for the wind to blow through and depart from us. We want to prepare to be vessels. We want God to come and make this his holy habitation. And this is what we're working toward. We know that when we came back to this building that Jesus had told us before that you're not a church. When we first started meeting as a congregation, he said, I want to birth a church. And that he was going to create an upper room. And I thought, oh, this is the upper room back then. But no, when we moved back to this building, now he's preparing his upper room in earnest. So there is a lot God's going to do for us. But we have this responsibility, this responsibility to eat and drink and partake of him. And we know in the book of Ephesians, it says before Jesus could come and make hearts his home, that they needed to be strengthened in the spirit before that could even happen. happen. So I believe this is a time of strengthening this is a time where God's preparing us individual, individually and corporately to be that house he desires. So when we come together on Tuesdays, we're calling on his name as a congregation, as a corporate entity. And when we come together on Tuesdays, it's a very special change in the atmosphere. We can feel the one accord in the room. We are in the first stages of creating a spiritual portal that's going to connect heaven to earth. And we know we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a prayer for that corporate portal to be created. And we know that after John gave his messages to the overcomers, he immediately said, I see a door open in heaven. And we know that when Michael Ficus came after the Lord had uh, given him his word for Kingdom Life Church, he saw a door open in heaven over this congregation. And so this is a very serious time of preparation, but the joy. How many of you have been feeling the joy of anticipation that actually there's been a turning point? Something has shifted recently in the atmosphere, I believe, over this nation and over the church. And I believe he's saying to come, enjoy, enjoy me, enjoy my presence for all things are almost ready. So what let's do now, let's just close our eyes and go to Jesus, focus on Jesus in you. And I see so many people smiling. It's because there's joy in this. That's the, that's the joy of the Lord. That's the fruit of the spirit of joy. That's not just something we're making up. That's the reality of his presence in us and it's being expressed in this entire room. We are partaking of him. Now drink it in. Drink it in. Receive it. Partake of him as your life supply. Eat and drink for a table is prepared before you. <laughs> You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. 
For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.